I think medicine is one of the most clearly beneficial applications for AI systems. So I'm really happy to see people like Vivek Natarajan, my guest today, develop ways to leverage today's systems to expand the availability of clinical knowledge and help out people who may not have direct or easy access to doctors. This is The Gradient Podcast. I'm Daniel Bashir. The best way you can help me out with this project is by sharing it with people you know and by leaving ratings and feedback. And now, Vivek Natarajan. Where I wanted to start this conversation, before we dive into a couple of the really great, great papers and projects you've been working on, is one thing you've, you've been saying, I think, in a couple of different places, is that you think the, the concept, and this is a very broad concept of, of an AI doctor, or something that we could call an AI doctor, is no longer out of the realm of science fiction. And I think we, we probably don't need to rehearse the whole chat GPT sequence that everybody has heard a million times right now to get us there. But I'm wondering if you can maybe paint the picture concretely for me about how, how you think about that and maybe what that non-science fiction world looks like for you, how you conceptualize what AI doctor means. Yeah, um, it's uh, firstly, it's a pleasure to be over here uh, and speaking to you, Daniel. Um, so for me, I think I would maybe want to first start off with like the motivation as to why such a thing should poss- probably exist in the world. And so for me personally, I grew up in India and in you know, parts of the country that I grew up in, for many people going to see a doctor was often not an option. So it meant like walking 30, 40 miles in extreme heat or giving up on a day's wages or going without food. And so I knew people who had like not seen a doctor in their entire lifetimes. And this is true not just in India, but in several other countries, uh, which are in some of the more developing parts of the world, right? Um, and uh, so it's, it's one of those root node problems that I think kind of like prevents a large part of the world's population from reaching their fullest possible potential uh, because you're not able to identify like, you know, problems with your own inherent biology, uh, and your human instantiation. And so that prevents you from optimizing yourself to be the best possible uh, version of yourself and contribute to the world. And so hopefully we can like, you know, move past that, you know. So, and so this is one of the great things with AI in the sense that it is making such knowledge and such expertise in different fields available broadly. And so this is one of the root node problems that I've been thinking about for a long period of time. And even when I was in my undergrad, a few friends and I, we were, uh, you know, building this app called Ask the Doctor Anytime, Anywhere. And so the name is very, very descriptive and kind of tells you what we're trying to do. But back then, and this is like 10 years back, uh, the technology and AI needed for such a thing to exist was just not ready. And so when I talk about technology, what I mean is, you know, simple things like internet connectivity. Uh, back then, people just had, you know, the feature phones, not smartphones in most parts of the world. Um, and so you can't really imagine like apps that require a lot of data, uh, you know, really being used by people over there. Uh, and then uh, of course the machine learning, deep learning was still just getting started, uh, and so on and so forth. And natural language processing and understanding was still very rudimentary, logic based, rules based. Um, and so when we were trying to build that system, we realized that this was not going to scale at all. There was no possible uh, way in which we could do this. Um, but you know, you don't take a straight line path to where you want to go. I mean, it's like always curved and rounded, but ultimately you do end up getting there one way or another. Um, and, uh, you know, piggybacking on the arc of progress in technology and in AI over the last decade, right? Uh, and when you th- think about technology, now smartphones are everywhere. People in parts of like rural parts of India and Africa, uh, and similar other places are regularly consuming like gigabits of data on their internet, uh, uh, on their f- smartphones and so on and so forth. Uh, YouTube videos are very, very popular. And then obviously the progress in AI, and especially with large language models since the advent of the Transformers and GPT class of models. Um, So we're seeing that these models are inherently much, much better at understanding language, and that is a huge thing. And that gives us the scaffold to do like more combinatorial generalization with other modalities in the picture. And so when you have all that progress, you can build on that foundation. And uh, that foundation means you can have systems that... uh, are able to democratize medical expertise, but a lot of other things like scientific expertise as well, uh, legal expertise, financial expertise, and so on and so forth. And so when you have like such expertise and such knowledge in the pockets, what can people do? And so that is the question over here. Um, And so my personal focus is again on medicine and biology, because again, as I outlined, that's a root node and that's a problem that's uh, of great interest to me. 
but I know several other smart friends of mine who are all like, you know, building on this foundation, but in their specific areas of interest and trying to make this expertise broadly available at scale to everyone everywhere worldwide. And so in that future, I think like the possibilities are immensely exciting. Um, so hopefully, you know, people do not have to deal with not being able to know what is wrong with them in their human body can really get like expertise and access to the best health and nutrition advice so that they can really optimize themselves. And because historically, if you think about this, uh, not just the last hundred years, but even uh, stretching back, like medicine has been in some ways never been personalized. It's taking, you know, what is uh, good for the average person. And you can talk about the description of what the average person is. Uh, that's probably uh, a white male, uh, middle age, and we try to apply it to everyone everywhere. But we know that biology and medicine is inherently personal, right? I mean, your body is different to what uh, even your brother's is, even if that's your twin brother or sister or whatever. And so like trying to generalize from that one person to everyone doesn't work everywhere. And so there's so much potential left to like, you know, in individually optimize what you're doing and how you treat people, how you like just make people live their better selves. And so that is what we're building towards. And in that future, uh, if we can get there, and it's still a long way, I'm still, I still believe that you know, the concept of uh, democratizing medical expertise is still like in the early days of self-driving cars, when you had those cars back in 2012, you know, running around the streets of Palo Alto and Mountain View. Yeah. And it, 12 years for us to get to a stage where you have Waymo today and maybe Tesla in a few months, uh, the robot taxis. And I still think we are in the early demo phases of, uh, so I would stay away from the phase of AI doctors and I'll tell you why in a second. Sure. But like, you know, democratizing uh, medical expertise. We're still in the demo phase, but I hope it doesn't take us a decade. I think it can be achievable, achievable in a much faster time frame. I think one thing that's really worth pulling out about the immediate future you just painted and what you are trying to do right now my one of my friends is, is thinking, just as you kind of noted, that there's a very parallel thing when it comes to democratizing legal expertise, for instance, even for some of the most basic things you might want to know. If you really want to get this correct, you might have to go and pay a lawyer some crazy number of dollars per hour just to make that accessible. When it comes to medicine, I suppose, you and I living in a place like the United States, the idea of, of quote unquote, AI doctor, however objectionable the term might be, or what it looks like to improve medicine with AI, that probably looks very different from us than for the people you're talking about who really just don't have access to doctors at all. And so there really is the sense of what you're saying. One of the greatest impacts you can make is the fact that we have these models and if we can jigger them in the right way so that they're actually helpful for people and that they give the kind of knowledge these people need without hallucinating and things like this, then you're, you're solving a really, really major problem, even if for the people sitting in the Bay Area, for instance, that doesn't look like the, oh, I thought, you know, Geoff Hinton said that deep learning was going to automate radiologists or something. It's, it's a very different kind of picture. And, a very, and, and I think it, it feels like a much more impactful one. Yeah, um, certainly. And again, I, I don't think uh, for even people in you know, in the United States or in the more advanced countries, uh, access to medical expertise is that uniform. Sure, uh, sure. So if you look at like the wait times for getting an appointment with your primary care doctor, even in like major cities like in Seattle and Boston, that can regularly stretch into like months um, if you don't have the right connections or the right insurance and so on and so forth. And for certain specialities that could be much, much longer. And so uh, this problem is not just about like the more developing parts of the world or the global south as you want to call it but i think this problem exists everywhere and again the, the second part is uh, if you just look at how the medical industry has progressed and where our clinicians and care providers and caregivers and uh, doctors are spending time i would say only a very small fraction of it is in the actual practice of medicine and caring for the patient and a large part of it is around things that we have introduced to financialize medicine and you know make it a profitable business but that was never the original goal of medicine if you look back at how you know people historically have tried to like think about it the, the at the heart was always caring for another human uh, but unfortunately we've strayed away very very far from those ideals especially in the western countries and that's also true for other parts of the world and that inherently happens when you have, i mean 
when there is a lot of money involved. Uh, but hopefully with the advancements in generative AI, as you say, I mean, you mentioned something about hallucinations, I think that is really, really important. Like we can take away a lot of those administrative burden and really make it medicine more efficient so that if, for example, today physicians are able to care for only like, say, 10 people in a week or something like that, can we make that number like 100 or 1,000 and more? And so that's kind of the goal. And so I come back to this AI doctors are not meant to replace physicians, but really to amplify their expertise and experience and make it more broadly available. I love that vision. And maybe before we kind of get into some papers, pulling out the, the two things that I'm seeing here. Well, on the one hand, you have people would like to get care. And it's often better if people are having symptoms and things like this to deliver them actionable, useful, correct information and to do so quickly. As you mentioned, and that was a that was a good thing to, to call out on that in the United States, even sure care is not distributed evenly, people are going to have to wait weeks. And for, for certain sorts of conditions, that's really not something that is going to be very, very good. The other thing you talked about, the the kind of helping doctors really be doctors was something that came up a lot in this conversation I, I had with Shiv Rao a while ago, who's building a startup that I think is really focused on trying to remove this additional thing that doctors have to do when it comes to transcribing conversations and all of this, because that's just as what you're talking about, work that takes them away from really being able to engage with the patient as another human being. And so it, it sounds like you, you have kind of a similar vision of what maybe a doctor could be this almost maybe there's a there's like a platonic ideal or something of what it is to be a doctor and maybe just maybe things we can kind of walk along that path a little bit is that kind of how you see it yeah um i, I think so uh i mean one thing i would also want to point out that we should not ignore that you know with the progress in ai there are going to be uh, a lot of things that a doctor I is doing today or is supposed to do that an AI will just be superhuman in it or like much, much better at it, right? Um, and so I think that is also, so there is a nuance associated with that. Uh, but just because an AI is superhuman at like, you know, 10% of what a doctor does doesn't mean that the AI will replace everything what a doctor does. Um, and uh, so, for example, if you look at the trends in diagnosis and if you look at some of the research, uh, recent papers from our group and from elsewhere, uh, with all the progress that's happening, uh, to me at least, it seems like uh, in a few years, uh, these AI systems are going to be much, much better than humans at diagnosing uh, and predict predicting the trajectory of diseases for people. Um, so, so doctors need to be able to leverage and build on top of that. And if you're not doing that, then you're not providing optimal care to the patient. But diagnosing is just like one part of a doctor's work, workflow, right? And so there's so many other things that a doctor can uh, and should do. And hopefully with all the progress in AI, in different parts of like a doctor's workflow, uh, they can focus on the things that really AI cannot do and what doctors really want to do sometimes. And so, and what I really mean by that is like, when like a human seeks out a doctor, and we've done a bunch of different interviews over uh, several years now, I think what we hear from them is it's not just about like, you know, understanding what's wrong with me, but also sometimes about establishing that human-human connection. Um, and to me, that is not easily replaceable by an AI. So you can have AI systems in sim simulation that, you know, can really talk to you um, in a very empathic manner, in a kind manner, in a gentle manner, and that's great. Um, but... I don't know for sure if that's what humans are looking for. And so I think that part of care will at least stay in the human realm. But it should be very, very clear that there are a lot of parts of it where AI will just become better and doctors who leverage that will just become much, much better at providing care. And so at least in the immediate future, in the next few years, I would really hope that the standard of care is no longer just a doctor alone, but a doctor that is amplified by expert AI systems uh, which are probably based on large language models or a combination of such technologies. Yeah, I, I guess it feels like with, with, with appropriate nuance applied to this statement, it does feel like one of the really promising things here is we are seeing more of an opportunity than we might have had before to really imagine 
what patient care could look like in, in almost a more kind of customer centric fashion, as opposed to the I will take the best of, of what I can get, even if I have maybe a lot of not so very good options for different reasons. And that's really promising. I, I kind of want to dig into the weeds a little bit. And so maybe we can start with some of the early MedPalm studies you've done. And you kind of tackled these in a few different ways. You have done some really interesting work. One of the papers I, I kind of want to pull out, maybe we can pair these to our LMs and co-clinical knowledge and towards expert level medical question answering. And so a lot of a lot of what is going on here is the kind of fine tuning that you've been doing and the instruction tuning to kind of take flan palm, for instance, and turn it into med palm so that it can be very useful for the things that you need. And I think that one of the the things that comes out here is the question of when you're doing something like instruction tuning in this model, you have different evaluative standards that you want to align the kinds of answers it has on. And I'd love for you to riff a little bit on how you think about what those standards should be and how you justify them in relation to maybe the kind of helpful, harmless, honest triad that we're familiar with from RLHF? Yeah, no, uh, this, this is a great question. Um, and so before I get into the evaluation aspects, maybe I'll uh, spend a little bit more time talking about why we need that level of specialization. Uh, because uh, if you, uh, I mean, look at some of, the, uh, some of our peers in the industry, they would say that, uh, an LLM such as GPT-4 out of the box already encodes a lot of medical knowledge and it's able to do a bunch of different things. And uh, whether we like it or not, uh, chat GPT is being used in different kinds of clinical workflows, even though it uh, is, uh, from a legal standpoint, you I think uh, that's kind of dubious uh, right now. Um, so, I mean, so in our team, we've kind of like really gone in really hard on this notion of specialization or like what we like to call is sending foundation models to medical school. Um, and so the reason for doing that is if you think about, you know, models like uh, GPT-4 or Gemini, these models are like very strong intelligent substrates. Um, and because of the large scale pre-training that they undergo, uh, they are like a very smart friend of yours, like an IQ, uh, IQ 150s friend of yours. And so you can talk to them about a broad range of topics, uh, physics, poetry, philosophy, whatnot. Um, but if in real life you have a medical concern, do you go to that smart friend of yours? I hope not, right? I think you would always go to a doctor, someone who's licensed to practice medicine, who's undergone rigorous training. And no matter how smart you are, you can't replace those things. Um, and so it should not be any different with our AI models. So you can't just take a general purpose model, even though it might be very, very capable and expensive expect that it would naturally translate into clinical workflows and be really, really safe and reliable. And so that requires a lot of specialization. And so that's what we focus on. So we focus on making sure that the data that goes into the specialization phase is the highest quality medical tokens that we can get hold of, uh, respecting licenses and principles and all the rules and regulations that govern healthcare data, which is far more stringent than anything on the open internet. Uh, and then there's this next phase of making sure that these models are uh, getting hold of like getting hold of good, strong expert demonstrations and putting them in settings where they are collaborating with clinicians and using feedback to improve the behavior of the map uh, of the models and making sure that they are aligned with the values of the practice of medicine. And then the third phase is, uh, and this is very, very important, is uh, you can't release these models into the open world just like that. In, in medicine, in uh, drug discovery, there are well-established processes and guidelines. There are phases of clinical trials that people do. Uh, and once you do that, that is only when you're like certified to deploy uh, a drug or a medical device in the real world. And that takes years and there are like well-defined processes over there. And it should be no different for AI systems. We should not be, I believe, skirting the laws around that. Uh, no matter how capable or powerful your AI systems are. And so we require rigorous verification and validation studies over here to make sure that the model is doing what it is supposed to or like intended to be done, doing. And uh, we need to make sure that there are guardrails put around those systems so that if anything off track comes in, anything out of distribution comes in, the model behaves in the right way. And so there is no shortcut in medicine. I mean, in biology, it's very, very clear. A drug has to work in the human body. And similarly with AI systems in medicine, it has to do things the right way. And uh, that requires a lot of hard work 
and you know, not taking any shortcuts over here. And so that's what we are trying to do over here, making sure that anything that we put out in the real world has undergone uh, all these different phases, like making sure the best possible data is in these systems, making sure these models are aligned to the values and practice of medicine, and that we are taking the right path over here and doing like rigorous verification and validation studies as much as possible in a safe and controlled manner before we release the systems in the real world for use. So that's the overall arc of what we're doing over here. And so specifically with respect to evaluation again, so uh, there are, I think when you're working in a domain, there are things that are both good and bad. So uh, compared to like models like Gemini, GPT-4, we don't need this model to uh, talk to you about philosophy or uh, you know, come up with po poems or whatever. So we don't have to evaluate all those things. But then, you know, around the things that a doctor does, there are so many nuances over here. Uh, and so we need to make sure that we are measuring them. And so every time we <clears throat> start off working on a problem, uh, the first thing that we do in our team is making sure that people who have the clinical expertise sit down together with the people who are like the machine learning researchers and make sure that we come up with the right set of metrics that we can evaluate on. And that often stretches into, the, the variables can stretch into the hundreds sometimes, or even more. Uh, but I think rigorously documenting that is very, very important. And especially when you're trying to build out like such capable medical AI systems, uh, there are so many different facets or axes that you can, that you have to measure. And so these include things like clinical knowledge and clinical reasoning, but also things like when you're having a generative AI system, uh, how, uh, what is the agreement of the outputs that are produced with, you know, the scientific and clinical consensus, or in other ways, factuality of the outputs that the model is producing? Uh, and then, as you stretch into like dialogue and conversations, things like, uh, is the model able to communicate in an empathic tone and manner? Is it able to, like, you know, build like relationship with the person at the other end? Uh, is it perceived to be open and honest, and so on and so forth? And so, so it spans both the human aspects and also the clinical knowledge and reasoning aspects. And so this can become really, really complex and nuanced, but you need to get that right first. And then again, you don't immediately go into like building and specializing the systems, but rather you see, okay, what, if you have a baseline model, how well is it doing on all these things? Uh, so again, you do like uh, control studies in different uh, methods and mechanisms. So some of this might be retrospective where you already have the data, but often in like dialogue settings, you don't have that. So the only way you do this is with getting human actors or real physicians to play around with the systems and give us some metrics and measures. And then once you have that, you know, okay, uh, this is where my system stands today. This is where I need to really hit or reach to be able for, for these models to be clinically applicable. Uh, and so like, what can we do to improve these systems and bridge the gap? And so that is where all the research comes in. Um, and um, we try to optimize the systems to make sure that we can reach those goals. And so every research project in this domain is faced in that manner. Start off with the metrics, set up the proper baselines, and then you go and optimize for them. And then sometimes what happens is like when you are developing large language models or AI systems in general, the metrics or measures that we as ML researchers use can actually diverge quite a bit from uh, metrics that imply uh, clinical applicability or uh, uh, utility in the real world. And it's important that when you are developing these models, uh, you're not only measuring things like perplexity or negative log likelihood, but also having like very quick mechanisms uh, to evaluate things that are more reflective of real world utility. And then that can speed up your real world iterations very, very quickly. I was hoping to have you reflect on the particular axes you choose for your evaluation framework and how you choose them. So if I can list off a couple that came up in your MedPalm2 performance and multi-med QA paper. The high quality answer traits come from things like better reflecting consensus, better reading comprehension, better knowledge recall, better reasoning. And to an extent, some of these are, are pretty clear things you would want out of a medical question answering system. But it does feel like you could you could imagine certain nuances of the sorts of axes of alignment that might be desirable or non-desirable for a system like this and how that, as you said, kind of differs in slight ways from what your generic chat GPT needs to look like, for instance. One one thing I'm wondering about, I don't know if this is going to be relevant in the medical case, but the kind of helpful, honest, harmless triad that we always talk about, one thing that people kind of complain a little bit about is that the way in which the models, you know, the model kind of articulates itself and, and interacts with you, it can be a little bit 
overly kind, for instance, and, you know, not really push you on anything, for instance. So you could imagine that maybe not being the best in a clinical setting. If you are speaking with a doctor and there's something wrong with your health and, you know, your doctor actually needs to tell you like, hey, something's wrong here and is willing to be confrontational. So I'm wondering how you think about what axes to include, what axes not to include. Again, noting that some of them are just general things you would want out of a conversational system, but also how you how you justify those. Yeah, uh, great question. So I think the metrics that are used uh, for general purpose uh, LLMs, uh, the, the ones that you uh, articulated over here, they're, I think, a good starting point. But then when you think about like, okay, where you're using medical specialized LLMs, uh, then things start to diverge a little bit or expand a little bit more. Um, right. And so the intended use, again, is really, really important. So if your LLM is supposed to be facing like um, a normal layperson without any kind of medical expertise, then you may want the model to be talking in a manner that really explains medical terminology really, really well. Uh, and probably appears to be kind and empathic and so on and so forth, right? And at the same time, being able to deal with uh, different kinds or ways in which uh, a normal layperson might uh, pose a question. Uh, For example, some people may not have the best uh, capabilities to express themselves in English, for example, and so they might miss out on information. And so how how robust is your model to all those things? Uh, So those become important. And at the same time, if your model is facing a clinician, uh, if you come up with like, uh, you know, prose with like 500 words or so on and so forth, like with all the disclaimers, uh, clinicians are not going to use your system because they don't have the time to read through all, all those things. So you have to be to the point, direct, and uh, not like, you know, skirt around things. And so that is important. So you need to understand where you, what is your use case? What is your intended use? Who's your user? And then adapt your metrics that you're measuring according to that. And also the people who are evaluating your system should be re- reflective of those end potential end users that you have. So, uh, for example, if you're measuring things like clinical knowledge and clinical reasoning and uh, agreement with scientific and clinical consensus, then you would want the people who are measuring that to be expert clinicians. And again, this varies. And so sometimes you may have, you, you might be doing projects where you are evaluating speciality performance. Uh, and so if you're evaluating speciality performance in, say, neurology, you can't have a primary care physician assist for that because there's so much differences between the two. Uh, and so those are where some of the challenges come in. Uh, so depending on the intended use, you need to get the right kind of person to be able to evaluate your system. And then on the flip side, sometimes it's obviously more easier. But like if your intended use is again for like uh, normal lay people, then you should be able to get like diverse populations of people. Uh, and see how their how their reactions are, and see how they perceive the systems to be helpful. Uh, how, how how actionable they perceive the insights from the system to be coming to be. So I think those things become really key. Uh, so one thing I would maybe want to point out a little bit is when we started doing the MedPalm work, we were still very early in this arc of development with LLMs, and it's still only been like a year back when we did this, but it feels like a lot of progress has happened. Uh, so at that point of time, we weren't maybe I would say trying to boil the ocean in some ways. We were like saying, okay, what are the things that we can do very quickly and that will tell us, okay, like where we are with uh, with uh, LLMs today and their applicability in the clinical domain. And so we tried to put together like an axis that we felt uh, would give us a good indicator of where we are. And so that included things like harm and bias. And that is, again, like very, very subjective and we can talk about it for a long period of time. But that's also important, right? I mean, um, so... We put that together and we measured and we saw progress and we saw that when you compare that with expert physicians, the models were stacking up really, really well. Uh, but as the systems became more complicated and so with our follow-up work, for example, with Amy, which is more and more closer to an agent kind of system, uh, there, uh, the the evaluation rubric that we have, the framework that we have, the reader study that we did, that became far more complex. Uh, but the key thing over there is we aren't trying to reinvent the wheel. Uh, So a lot of the evaluation rubrics that we use are actually things that are used to assess medical trainees and doctors in medical school. And so we borrowed uh, from that. So the rubrics that we use are actually derived from uh, the UK uh, Medical Education Board and also from parts of Canada and India and others. And so we looked at all of them and then we pulled out, okay, what are the things that we need that we think are applicable over here and we can use over here? And so... The key thing is, again, to not reinvent the wheel because uh, 
uh, in some ways, uh, when you're building these AI systems, it's not too different from like training humans for, say, medical expertise and so on and so forth. So we can build on top of a lot of that knowledge over here and use that for evaluation. And so that's what we've been trying to do. A particular axis I, I was hoping to spend a little bit of time with you on, and this is thinking a little bit farther forward, I suppose, in terms of what we want these systems to look like, and acknowledging that, as you said, you're not trying to boil the ocean right now, is uh, a kind of important axis here is the alignment with scientific consensus, consensus among experts. And you have this result that, you know, MedPalm substantially outperformed Flanpalm in terms of alignment with scientific consensus. I, I do think, though, that people rightly raise troubles for scientific consensus as a thing to kind of optimize against. And of course, in a lot of cases, you know, doctors who are experts in their fields, they, they will know what's best. They have that lived experience. I've worked with so many patients, but there definitely are times where aligning oneself with scientific consensus as much of the time as possible might not necessarily be doing what's best for patients. And so, of course, acknowledging that you're concerns here, we're looking at what LLMs can do right now and how that reflects some of these metrics. I'm, I'm curious how you think about for the long term, as you continue developing these systems, how, how you want to think about that relationship to scientific consensus and what you would want to do in maybe the smaller subset of cases where that can come up against doing what's actually best for a patient, for instance. Yeah, again, this is a Really great question and obviously a very uh, nuanced question as well. Um, so the way I think about this is, again, uh, it comes down to the notion of uh, safety and scalable oversight mechanisms that we can build into these systems. Um, and so as long as you have those guardrails effectively built in, then the model can maybe uh, not give you regurgitated or safe answers, but rather can, you know, not... I wouldn't like to use the word quantify it, but like explore the space of human knowledge or, or what is consensus or what is scientific knowledge over here or clinical knowledge over here a little bit more broadly. Um, but the key thing is to have like an expert in the loop who can judge what the model responses or answers are uh, and use them appropriately uh, downstream. Um, and maybe I'll take a step back and it's, it's more like if you think about like the arc of progress with uh, some of the... AI systems in places like Go, for example. Uh, the reason why maybe you know AlphaGo was really so successful is that Monte Carlo tree search over there, uh, right? Um, and uh, if I don't think human brains are optimized to be able to do, do that kind of tree search, but AI systems can really do that well, and that is where the complementarity aspect can come in. And so if you do like, you know, restricted Monte Carlo tree search in the space of clinical knowledge and come back with, you know, important tidbits of information, uh, but you have to give that back to the expert and the loop who can then judge and verify it. And if you're able to do that effectively, then I think we can really, you know, improve the standard of uh, care in clinical settings. But that's not just true for clinical settings. That can, for example, if you think about broadly in like biomedicine and science in general, think about all the things that you can do when you pair an AI system that can effectively do Monte Carlo tree search with uh, human feedback and pa and pair that with the capabilities of the human brain for generalization and picking with some amount of intuition what is the best thing to do or what is the next hypothesis uh, or experiment to uh, verify and run. Uh, I think that can really accelerate progress. And uh, so that that is how I think about these is things and systems over here. The key thing, again, I come back to this, is the need for safety and scalable oversight and the need for an expert in the loop. And so if we have that, then LLMs can, you know, sometimes go, do not have to be like, you know, kept in like, you know, these boxes or jails or whatever that you want to keep it. I think they can like explore a little bit more and then really do what is right for the patient. And so that is the key thing over here. And, and you're, you're absolutely right. Um, what is, uh, you know, in even in some of the best hospitals in the world, they have guidelines and say, for the most part, you should just completely follow these guidelines. But then I, I do, we don't know for sure, uh, but it, it is possible that actually for a good chunk of the patients, you need to maybe deviate from the guidelines in order to be able to provide the best possible care to them. Um, the challenge is then, okay, uh, how can you do that with confidence? Uh, so having an expert in the loop helps. Uh, 
but then the other thing is again like being able to measure outcomes and that is really really hard in healthcare because i mean if you get it wrong that can lead to death maybe and that's not great and you don't want that uh so the other key thing that i beyond like safety and scalable voice type mechanisms is i think being able to build hardened simulation environments for what can happen in real world clinical settings and in the and in the human body and if you are able to pair those two things together and if that is high fidelity then i think we can you know do a lot more things with a lot more confidence that that we are able to do today and so i feel like those two things are where a lot of the progress over the next few years have to happen if we want to really explore the capabilities and potential of llms and ai systems more broadly and that's true not just in clinical med- medicine settings but also in science more broadly pulling this out to kind of the the real world of how this is going to interact with patients and maybe connecting it to something really important you said earlier one thing that that strikes here is the fact that a a fair amount of say clinical data or information we have about certain procedures and treatments are going to be or are often kind of averaged or there are disparities between the amount of data we have about the effects of certain clinical interventions on people with different demographic backgrounds for instance and so to an extent i think what you've talked about with guardrails and maybe the concept of say your medical question answering system or your conversational system saying you know telling you that it is uncertain about something that it is saying or saying hey uh this is something you should actually experiment with here are the things we know have worked on people here are their demographics or something like this and delivering what is probably very crucial information to a patient because it's important to know this procedure this intervention has worked on somebody but maybe that somebody is not you they have very different demographic data and so being aware of that as a patient and being aware that there are things that i can try that are probably not going to harm my health but i don't know if they will actually help me until i actually try them and then maybe establishing some kind of feedback loop where you were then as a patient able to provide that feedback this worked for me this did not work for me and having a virtuous cycle that way that that feels very important yeah um a- a- again the the interventions also uh matter quite a bit uh and the realm in which you are operating matters quite a bit and so uh a lot of my work is focused in clinical medicine where the interventions can range from taking a pill to something even more complex like a surgery and beyond and so those are maybe not easily accessible to everyone um uh, and so it, the other thing that often comes up in uh, you know clinical medic- medic- medical settings is uh, there's a resource optimization problem as well uh, and that is that is a nuance or a context that is missing with uh, medical ai systems today uh, in the sense that you know doctors when they account or like make a decision they also optimize for that they know that oh if i bring this person in and if i admit them i don't actually have an extra icu bed and so i can't really bring them in and so i need to like give them something else whereas I mean AI systems might try to give you the right answer but you really may not be able to get that resource necessary for that intervention or for that treatment and so that's another thing that you need to account for over here like the safest thing to do in many cases might be to like you know bring many people into the hospital run all sorts of tests and you know really see what uh, really understand what's going wrong with their body but then do we really have the resources i don't think that's true anywhere in the world uh let alone say in parts like uh, parts of the world like africa and india and so so that kind of situational contextual knowledge or world knowledge also needs to be baked into these systems as to what interventions are really possible uh and so as systems evolve i think that is the other bit that is missing with medical ai systems today uh which is uh building in that extra knowledge around the context of the world or the context in which they are operating in uh and that needs to be you know some amount of like additional guardrails or constitutions or things like that that you can like impose uh that the systems have to follow to be able to come up with the best practices and treatment recommendations over here and then there are like a broad set of interventions that you know patient or like normal people like us can do when who are like trying to optimize their health and well-being to be like the best possible version of themselves um and again the key thing is to be able to as you say surface up information uh in a clear and explainable manner as to saying okay these things seem promising but these are like where you can you know go wrong uh and being able to cite those sources and studies accurately uh is important but then the key thing is like when you surface that information and then someone acts on it like who's 
with whom does the liability lie over there uh, and so it is important to be able to like really communicate that very very accurately and clearly um, i mean today for a large part of that we trust human influences um, i can imagine in realms like um, longevity and biohacking uh, ai influence uh, kind systems uh, that are trained on like the entire corpus of you know human knowledge and scientific knowledge uh, might actually become even more popular so imagine like i don't know like an ai version of andrew huberman uh, i don't see that being far away to be honest yeah i have um i have a last question i want to ask you on this pair of papers and th- this might be a, a slightly annoying question but it was something i was really curious to get your thoughts on so when when i was reading llms and co-clinical knowledge i was confused by by a particular sentence in there because one of the the key things that you talk about in going through this paper is this question of, of possible data contamination and how that affects whether MedPalm is is really just memorizing data. So I think you looked at the overlap between MedPalm responses to multi-med QA questions and the Palm training corpus, and you observe pretty much no overlap and then minimal overlap between some multiple choice questions and the training corpus. So that's pretty good justification that maybe it's not just memorization that is going on here. But but one of the sentences you said was that it is likely that the Palm Free Training Corpus included significant medical related content. And so I was kind of confused by that hedge of it is likely because it seemed like your your team had access to the data set and could make a more grounded claim. So so not to like ask you to say things that are confidential or anything, but I, I was just kind of curious about the the choice of wording there. Yeah, I think we just wanted to... Uh make sure that uh, we are not saying that all the medical knowledge is purely coming from that uh, instruction fine-tuning phase uh, or that prompt tuning phase, uh, which is part of the MedPalm paper. Uh, but rather, when you are doing large-scale internet pre-tuning on web pages, web articles, uh, even things like Reddit, there's a lot of like people talking about clinical, medical, biology uh, information. And so the model is obviously seeing them, but it is not maybe forced to pay special attention to them. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that people get that. And so that's the reason for making that, but you, uh, I mean, you could go and maybe try and say, okay, like these tokens roughly correspond to medicine and biology. And so what percentage of that? Um, I mean, that's an exercise that we actually can do, uh, but we didn't think that that was necessary. What was more important, maybe at least in the context of that work, uh, and especially when compared to some of the other works that were coming out, was to like give a very accurate uh, quantification of the overlap between the actual evaluation set and the pre-training data. Uh, and so that's what we ended up focusing on doing it. Uh, we didn't want to like you know just go ahead and say it's also more of a subjective thing. I would say like okay, what is really medical token versus non-medical token, and the context matters over there. So that that was the intention over there with that statement. Yeah, that that makes sense. I, I guess a, a reason I'm curious about this is I, I have these broader wonderings about and a lot of your work and kind of hearing you talk about it. You're you're very careful with the claims that you want to make about the abilities of these systems, and it seems like you want to be really grounded about that. So I was I was curious about this kind of broader question about how you as a scientist working in this domain that is going to have very important impacts for people and the work you do, the systems you build, there there are cases where there could be life and death consequences or, or significant impacts on a patient's health. And so I'm, I'm just very broadly kind of curious about how you as a scientist think about the, the justification and, and the phrasing of the claims you make, because it does feel like that can have pretty important impacts. Yeah. Um, so the Again, the, the key thing over here is uh, like uh, many of my senior teammates uh, who have a lot more experience in clinical medicine, uh, they like to say that healthcare really moves at the speed of trust. Um, and so it is really important to be able to like make grounded claims that are um, uh, not trying to be overly exuberant because if you look at everything else going on, all the hype that is going on, uh, I, I mean, yeah, we don't have to fall into that. I think real advancement happens when you're doing rigorous science. Uh, and that is that underpins a lot of medicine in many ways. Like, So uh, it is, I think, really important to be able to do that. And, and uh, if you are able to do that uh, and build trust, and trust is not just with, uh, say, just the people who are going to be using these systems, but it is very, very important to build trust with the medical community, with clinicians, um, and uh, obviously clinicians as a whole are quite opinionated people and so it's not so easy and so and they have like you know 
practices and ways in which they have been doing things for years. And so the more and more you can ground in their way of doing, the easier it is to bring them along with this journey. Because if you think about it, the, the arc of progress, it really implies uh, societal transformation is in how uh, care is delivered and administered in probably everywhere in the world. Um, but if we, if you really believe in the capabilities of AI systems and if you really want to accelerate towards that future, uh, then we need to bring everyone along with us in this journey. And so that is the key over here. And so uh, instead of like doing hype mongering, because that is happening regardless of us, I think it's more important for us to be doing, you know, r- rigorous science uh, that is really grounded in actual uh, experimental um like very rigorous verification and validation studies, basically. So that that is the key over here. And again, I would say it's not just about like clinicians. It's also about people who make policies and regulations, uh, people who are like social scientists, people who are like ethicists. It's important to bring everyone with you in this journey. And of course, we can't uh, ignore the patient perspective uh, and broadly people's perspective because again, healthcare is personal. I really see that. And again, and a lot of your work, you and your team are pretty careful and and grounded with the claims you make. And you're certainly not among those making over exuberant claims. But at the same time, unfortunately, for many of us, there are a lot of people out there who are making over exuberant claims. So kind of going back to the speed of trust thing you talked about, I'm curious if you if you worry about that kind of hindering you when it comes to the trust you're able to build with the kinds of stakeholders, clinicians who might maybe look at the AI field as, as almost a monolith and, you know, seeing some of the louder voices who are, many of them are at odds sometimes, but there are many kind of over exuberant voices out there. So, so I'm curious how you think about how that interacts with you building the kind of trust you need to build to have the impacts you want to have. Yeah. Um, again, it's not easy. We are not immune to some of those pressures, uh, especially when we see, some other related systems that may not have been so rigorously verified and validated, picking up a lot of use cases, which we are not completely sure about, um, like, or like performance metrics and so on and so forth. Um, So yeah, you you are right. I mean, uh, the key thing is like medical AI is maybe not really a new field. It dates back to the early days of AI, like a lot of motivations for uh, people at MIT, like Marvin Minsky actually building, trying to build like general purpose AI systems was actually clinical diagnosis. Uh, so it started way back, like 1960s, 1970s, and it has happened quite a bit. And again, with the new era of deep learning, uh, people have been trying to work on this field for a long period of time. But the difference was maybe until, say, last year, uh, the reciprocation from like the broader clinical community, the broader medical community wasn't there. Uh, and uh, there's a saying that, you know, healthcare in terms of technology lags behind the world by like a decade, if not more. And that was true. Uh, And the key thing is, again, the was. Uh, I think what has changed is uh, a lot of different problems within healthcare has come to a head. And if I were to categorize it, that's broadly around uh, accessibility, availability, quality, consistency, and price. Uh, And uh, not just patients, but also physicians are, you know, really struggling in many different ways. And so it's kind of reached like a tipping point. Um, and so with all those factors coming in, with all the progress, especially over the last year, what I have seen is people like, uh, care delivery organizations, physicians, everyone, like really now trying to jump in on this wave and trying to make use of this. And that, that, is, that is actually great because, uh, I started working in medical AI in roughly around 2018 and for like four years, it was so difficult to get any kind of attention. I mean, there's a lot of research papers that are published, uh, and we've done that in some of the best journals, but like in terms of real world use and clinical settings, it was very, very difficult. But with, uh, you know, I think chat GPT is, has been like a transformative mo- moment for healthcare in many different ways. Uh, but with that and with our work on MedPalm, uh, what we have just seen is the complete reversal. Now, like some of the biggest EMR systems are jumping into generative AI. There's like generative AI used in like transcription of clinical conversations and so many different things. Um, it's not revolutionizing the clinical workflow as such, but like more like integrating generative AI to try to make like, you know, patient experiences better. And so I think that is great. But the, again, the, the important thing is you've gone from one extreme where you were not even considering technology and AI to another extreme where you are 
integrating without doing rigorous verification and validation and seeing whether it really does things that you wanted to do and does it really like really meaningfully improve your outcomes and so i feel like even this other extreme while it's actually quite positive for me and my team and the work we are, that we are doing is actually also not good because moving too fast can also really like really sometimes break things and really lead to bad things and so what we really don't want is uh, like a terrible event happening um and you can imagine how that might unfold in various different ways really again then like put a stop to all the progress and slow things down and so it's important that we i mean we understand like you know there's this exuberant optimism and that's great because it's all grounded in actual real progress that we're seeing with ai systems but not shy away from the principles of medicine and science and that is rigor in everything that we are doing and so the more we are able to you know build on top of that i think the future that we all really want and are envisioning that will happen but if you try to sh- take shortcuts and i can keep coming back to this there's no shortcuts in medicine yeah uh, then uh, i think there's a real possibility of things going wrong um again we can't control the entire community there's always going to be uh, influencers or people who are trying to make a quick buck uh, and sometimes maybe really well intentioned people who may not have any other options uh, trying to do things with by taking shortcuts but the least that we can do is set an example for how things should be done right in the right way and so that's where the focus is right now let's talk a little bit about maybe the no shortcuts aspect of things and and kind of another case of some of the promises of what we're seeing today i i thought your genetic discovery enabled by an llm paper was really really interesting and and your group basically found that this model you know a novel biogenic model for susceptibility to spontaneous hearing loss was developed in this paper so basically in medpalm 2 you found was able to analyze these gene phenotype relationships and and generate novel hypotheses and it's it's worth the caveat that this work was done with mice and kind of among all of that though there's again you know a lot of cases where we'll do things on you know we want to understand the utility of something for a clinical application so if we're study it in mice and kind of go from there so you're you're kind of accelerating some of these things the parts of it i'm curious about maybe to start with is i'm i'm wondering if you can unpack novel hypotheses how you think about that and maybe what about the nature of this kind of problem like genetic discovery makes llms kind of amenable to this problem yeah um so uh maybe i'll just start off by saying that a lot of credit to that work uh, goes to dr gary pels at stanford uh, who's a very experienced uh i actually don't know what his specialty is because he's broadly knowledgeable about so many different things and he's been like uh uh like a really like a guardian to us in terms of like a lot of the folks in our team were like very very new and inexperienced and really building on top of this uh uh but to have that perspective uh that perspective of like restrained optimism has been really great and he's been working with us for a long period of time uh now and we're really excited for many other things that are in the pipeline and so it was mostly his idea uh and we're building on top of it um and so i think again it comes back to this hypothesis generation thing is uh it, it's interesting because uh, a lot of the rlhf post training optimizations that are done with um uh LLMs today uh are actually trying to reduce hallucinations right uh, but if you want to do hypothesis generation uh that actually calls for like creativity and exploring the space of knowledge um and uh that actually means you want to actually have systems that are maybe hallucinating a little bit more and so i like to say that you know hallucinations and creativity are two sides of the same coin and so depending on the application that you have uh hallucinations might actually be good um and there are simpler ways to get this uh like temperature is uh, uh is a hyperparameter that a lot of us tune, tune with to get like uh, more uh, exploration of the space of generations and so on and so forth but then there are other ways in which you can in your post training phase or even in your pre training phase really encourage like this exploration uh and people are experimenting with you know approaches that are mirroring of monte carlo research and things like that depending on the application over here uh and so that's coming and i'm really excited about what's going to happen in the next year um but for this one again it's grounded in like still the early generation of llms and when i say early generations i think the gpt3 gpt4 medpalm class of models uh, and what they were kind of trying to do uh and the problem over here was um, see so ha- we have these uh, notion of genome wide association studies that are trying to tell you uh the associations between certain clinical phenotypes and gene candidates 
but they tend to give you like a lot of possibilities um, and there was no real filtering mechanism other than you know, human intuition uh, and uh, expertise and so I mean, people used to see okay these are all there's all these associations that could go into the thousands for uh, certain things and then they would pick like one or two and that's really imperfect or imprecise science and so the question was can we do that filtering in a much better mechanism and so that is where llms come in right and so llms are trained on broad internet corpora so much more knowledge that i don't think humans can fathom of like processing even in their entire lifetimes and then if you pair that with uh, the ability to recall knowledge to retrieval augmented systems in real time manner like access to scientific journals and so on and so forth what can these llms do can they come up with interesting hypotheses uh, to help with these uh, associations and again i wouldn't it at, at the surface level that paper seems quite simple but it maybe is not simple because uh, uh, like if you look at like how genes are represented uh, they're like combinations of tokens that you don't see very often and so things like the tokenizer plays a big role over here in terms of being able to um accurately get some of these hypotheses right but once you fix all those things with your llm training process uh then and you combine that with a retrieval augmented system that has access to the latest and greatest scientific publications then you start seeing um interesting hypotheses being generated by these systems um maybe another quick thing that i want to point out over here is today a lot of like the modeling that is happening uh with uh in the space of genomics actually focuses on like the the base pair level like encoding the 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 genome as such and people have done that for uh, prokaryotes but they are trying to do that for eukaryotes and the human genome as well uh, with like larger and larger models we are not trying to do that uh, we feel like that is maybe still one step uh, below the right kind of resolution needed for accelerating Uh, genetic discovery so we're still working with at the language level with uh, gene token levels uh, that are already well known and commonly appear on the internet and in scientific publications and our hypothesis over here that resolution is sufficient for us to do like interesting things uh, over here so we don't have to go like that one level of base pair below and like really try to understand like uh, re-understand biology in some sense and there are various people doing that i think that's still important but that's not our focus our focus is with like current language understanding of uh, llms Uh, and working at the gene token level what are the interesting relationships and hypotheses that you can uncover can you expand a little bit more on on why you think that why you think that for what you're interested in this level above is kind of the right level of abstraction and maybe a bit about how you think about what working at that base pair level is useful for yeah um so i think there's again a large set of tasks that uh, people who are encoding at the base pair level they care about and they are doing and they see interesting gains with uh, llm transformer kind of systems uh, but again the, it's important like what task you're working for and for us like uh, if you're like working with sequences of atgcs or whatever you can't really associate those sequences at any resolution with what is there in like scientific publications or in the internet and so you have to take that one level of abstraction up uh to what is actually common in the internet to be able to do these kind of things and so uh i mean so that's the simple reason over here i'm not saying like that resolution uh, the lower resolution is not that interesting or important it, it it is but i think for the application that we really care about we feel like working at this resolution level is sufficient and so that's what we're doing um and uh yeah again the key thing is uh, you have to pair that with uh highly accurate scientific and medical publication and research information and then the other thing is the expert in the loop uh, because you're really optimizing the models to sample the space of uh, genetic knowledge human knowledge and so a lot of it can be like absolutely nonsensical or like not make any sense at all uh, but what you need is a human in the loop who can very quickly call out like okay this is bullshit i don't want to talk think about this but then like really just look it's like uh, you know mining like gold or diamonds in some ways so you're going to look at a lot part of the space but then there might be one or two nuggets of information that are like really really interesting um and so in this work that's what happened like we literally like shared like thousands of hypotheses we used to send this over to uh dr pels and he would go through all of them and the important bit was is uh it should be very very efficient to verify these hypotheses uh right i mean if it takes like too long then th- this process is not scalable but like if you have someone who can like within seconds or in a minute say that something's uh 
not interesting uh, or whether something's interesting, then that becomes really scalable. And uh, again, I, I, I wouldn't want to say it's scalable, but it's like more uh, practical. And so that's what happened over here. Uh, we generated a bunch of different things, sent it over to Dr. Gary, and then he found a few that he thought were like, oh, these are great. And so, uh, and then one of those things really led to something that, I mean, they had been thinking about previously, but the model came up with something uh, and drew the right kind of connections and hypothesis in such a manner that felt like completely novel. Um, and so since the paper, we've actually, uh, we're almost close to completing the, ver uh, the verification over here. And so uh, this will be, I think, one of the first of its kind um, verifications of an AI discover, uh, AI assisted discovery in genetics. And so we're excited to be able to like talk about that uh, very, very soon. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we did this with mice because, again, it's easy to work with mice and do like the knockout experiments and so on and so forth. Uh, we probably won't be able to do it in humans that easily, but the things that we can do in humans are uh, either like, again, like simulations, like biological simulations of like uh, the human cell, like virtual cells. That's again a big area of focus in DeepMind and I also hear in NVIDIA and other places. Uh, but also things like uh, organoids and again, in vitro testing and so on and so forth. Um, so this approach i think is again uh, quite viable and i think it's going to uh, we're going to see evidence of this in a bunch of different places it's not just restricted to like uh, this hearing loss phenotype but i think it's going to be very very applicable in like neurodegenerative diseases um, in other like really difficult cases where we haven't like made a lot of progress but we're going to see suddenly a burst of progress happening because of this human in the loop uh, ai co-scientist approach the last thing I was really curious about with this paper was it was something you kind of talked about a little bit earlier, and this came up when you were talking towards the end about hallucinations from the large language model you saw and what your team kind of hypothesized or, or sort of identified as the factors causing this. And a really interesting one was the tokenizer kind of having difficulty, as you talked about earlier analyzing the gene symbols, you know, these consist of letters and numbers, and you can kind of incorrectly assign certain symbols to genes that they don't actually belong to. And then this leads to kind of false associations. And the other one, which was interesting there was just the next word prediction objective itself leading to spurious correlations. And when you when you kind of, when your team addressed this and talked about ways around it, so one of them you talked about was having access to external knowledge sources, for instance, it sounds like you you feel that these are issues that are maybe small enough or, or kind of addressable enough within the current paradigm and that you're not necessarily looking to take a step back and rethink all of this through in order to get us past this. Am I, am I reading you correctly? That seems to be how you think about this. Yeah, th that is correct. Um, uh, yeah, I think what we are saying is uh, you don't need like an AGI kind of system uh, to be able to really accelerate progress over here. Rather the current generation of LLMs with like careful tweaking uh, an injection of domain knowledge can still be like really, really helpful and useful. And I feel like we're still like very, very early in this. And of course, if there's more progress happening, then we will piggyback on top of that and build on top of that. But that shouldn't prevent us from doing these explorations uh, in different areas of biomedicine and science. And so this is one example of that where with like simple but careful tweaks of the system, uh, you can uncover interesting things and really you know, advance science in interesting ways. And so that was the goal over here. I want to talk a little bit about the the more recent work you've been doing on, on conversational diagnostic AI. And maybe to start with, I have another eval related question for you. And this is maybe again kind of looking forward. So one of one of the things you use here in your evaluation is this objective structured clinical examination. And maybe as we dive into this, you should say a little bit about what that is. But it's it's important to know, and I, I think you bring this up when you talk about it, that there are some disadvantages to this evaluative framework in that it fragments a clinician's task a little bit, and that's not quite a mimic of the real life situation. So I'm curious about how you think forward about correcting for some of these disadvantages in your evals, if that's something that you're interested in. And also maybe if you're, you're also thinking in the context of, well, this is maybe a system that is going to have a particular task in real life. And maybe it's not going to be, again, the, the quote unquote AI doctor that is just automating you. And so actually, I, I, I feel like there's maybe another argument you can make that this is actually okay, because the set of skills you're concerned with is pretty task specific. So I'm, I'm wondering how you think about all of that. Yeah, uh, again, uh, awesome question. So the 
the key thing with this uh, work was uh, you know the motivation for doing this is uh, un- until we did this work on Amy uh, a lot of the research uh, was in like we presented very well curated pristine information to an LLM and ask it to do things like answer a medical question or come up with a diagnosis um, and while I mean the, the progress and all of that was interesting uh like doctors never ever deal with such situations it's really really rare to have like all the information really well curated and given to you so the question that we were really trying to answer was in, under uncertainty can like an llm gather information in an empathic manner from like a real patient to be able to assist them in their clinical care journey uh and this is a very very different channel because you have to now engage in like multi turn conversations uh maybe over a long period of time and sometimes you know this can span like you know multiple visits and so on and so forth so these are like completely different skills uh compared to what we were evaluating until uh then with say the metcom class of models uh, or still is largely done with say some of the gpt4 evals that we are seeing um so so we were trying to do that and that again comes kind of very close to what like uh, how medical students are uh, assessed in medical um, in medical training um and so we decided to picky back on top of that and we and so because we have like amazing clinicians in our team we know like what is uh, like how, how these evaluations are performed and so we decided to build on top of this uh, oski framework and uh, i believe what happens is again i haven't been to medical school uh, but what happens is you have these uh, booths or stations and uh, you have uh, patient actors and these are these tend to be again like physicians uh, who have a lot of experience uh, and then the trainees go and sit on the other side and then they engage in a conversation uh and this is time bound but at the end of the conversation the the trainee has to come up with like a diagnosis and uh treatment recommendation and so on and so forth and then the the actor will also prefer, perform their own assessment because they like because they are well trained in this and so uh the combination of those two are used to assess uh medical trainees uh as far as i understand over here and so the key thing is that's again in person um and uh, there's a lot of like cues that doctors use that are visual but not language based um and uh, that is again clearly a restriction over here uh, or like a limitation of this work over here uh because we were doing this oski study with a virtual text chat interface and so the comparison that we have with doctors over here is probably not fair to them because they're not used to these text chat consultations also they are becoming like more and more popular um and so having said that i i feel like what is what this study kind of indicates is there's probably a new modality of medical consultation that is becoming increasingly viable that is based on text chats I and mean, people are used to doing text chats and uh, this kind of chat in- interface is how people have been interfacing with language models like gpt4 and gemini right um and so this suggests there's a new opportunity or a new interface that can be designed for care delivery which hasn't been popular so far so even with virtual care it's all based on video consultations but maybe text becomes viable maybe a synchronous text chat really becomes viable and that can again like democratize access to care and medical expertise but the key thing is i think you need ai over here because human doctors are not really trained to do this kind of thing uh, but that might change we don't know if this becomes really more popular so so that's the caveat over here and i feel like that is again an important thing because especially for some of the uh axes such as uh you know how empathic uh someone comes out to be um the the tone of the responses matter the detail of the responses matter and uh, ai systems don't tire they can continuously you know make sure that they are communicating the information in the right tone with the right level of detail uh whereas for human doctors again some of the doctors that we had in the evaluation study it is possible that they were coming after a long day of clinical practice and then they were like participating in the studies and like you know chapo to them um and uh so so i feel like there are there are significant limitations that i want to again stress and call out over here but having said that like the results are very very promising and that like we now have ai systems that seem broadly capable of being able to acquire information under uncertainty and really interrogate and get the right and best possible information to really assess people in their care journeys and so uh so we're now going to be building on top of that uh and put these models in more real world workflows and seeing how they perform and whether they are really helping patients and providers and really meaningfully improving outcomes We talked a little bit earlier about the kinds of data that may be missing from like a demographic perspective for instance when it comes to delivering the kinds of patient outcomes that might be best for real life patients. 
But I'm curious about maybe a different level of, of chopping up the world or chopping up the set of possible types of data one could have. You do include different sorts of data to train on. So you have medical reasoning data from MedQA, long form medical QA, you have summarization, real world dialogue. I'm curious how you think about, well, we, we know what the contributions of each of those are going to kind of look like based off of the sorts of data they are. But I'm, I'm curious how you assess things like maybe the relative importance of different data sets. I think one of the earlier papers we discussed, there were mixture ratios of the data that you put in. And I could see that this was in part based off of just the number of kind of examples there were in those data sets. But I'm curious how you think about those relative levels of importance and maybe if there if there is another kind of data that you feel like would be useful for the sorts of applications you want that is just missing from all this? Or do you feel like you've covered all the bases in that regard? Um, yeah, I think the challenge with uh, working in medical AI is just data is the biggest problem. And it's never easy to get hold of data and for good reasons, actually. Um, so the, the sample sizes that we deal with, the data sizes that we deal with, some of our friends who are working, say, more on the pre-training side of things or in computer vision, they laugh at us. Like, how come you're building models uh, with such small... I mean, but that's the challenge that we have to deal with and put up with. Um, and so, again, with this work on Amy, if you, if you look at it, we had these multiple iterations of the model. And so we had to bootstrap with whatever real-world data that we had, which was reflective of clinical language and knowledge and whatever conversational data that we had. Um, and so that is why we, we use some of these data sets, like the question answering data set, uh, the summarization data set. Um, and I believe there might be a few other things in there. Uh, and then we had like access to a corpus of real world conversations. But again, the challenge with some of the transcribed real world conversations is they introduce these artifacts like ums and ahs and other things. And then especially if you're having like a text chat, you don't want a model to be able to to be like mimicking that and putting that in your conversations, that's like terrible. Um, so they were not perfect, but they were like what we needed to bootstrap the system. Um, but then once you bootstrap the system, then you can set up this simulation environment for diagnostic dialogue. And so that's where we really innovated on. We had this multi-agent framework where we had uh, this doctor agent, uh, but we also had like a patient simulator and a patient agent over there. We had a moderator that moderated the conversation between the two and resulted in a dialogue rollout. And then we had a critique that was giving feedback. And then we put that back uh, in an inner self-play loop, uh, which again helped the, the doctor agent and the patient agent uh, refine the dialogue. And so we had like lots of dialogue rollouts that we generated. And then we had like an outer auto eval slash uh, feedback loop uh, that in many ways uh, reci uh, reflected the clinical evaluation axis that we're talking about uh, and gave like scores. Uh, and then we used those scores um, to judge which dialogues were useful and interesting for us to include in the fine tuning, the next round of fine tuning. Um, so we did. We designed that framework and then we did like you know multiple rounds of iterations over here which is what we call that the outer self play of fine tuning over here and the interesting bit was uh we were seeing that with every round of like these self play iterations the models were getting better and better and they were like getting better not only at playing like the doctor agent uh, but also at playing the patient and the simula uh, and the critique and so on and so forth and so uh, and then we were doing the evaluations again, like in uh, using auto raters and in an offline manner. Uh, we were seeing that the performance on the clinical uh, metrics that we really care about over here were like improving. Um, so we did that for a few rounds, uh, primarily because we wanted to like execute this, freeze the model for the study and then use it in the study. Uh, but since then, we've been trying to push it even further and feel like we are still very early in this process of designing uh, really detailed simulation environments. Uh, and and I feel like the simulation game, at least for language, has like really progressed. And so we can do like really, really interesting and complex things. And so we feel like we're still very, very early. And so there's going to be a lot more progress. And we're like very early days in like this exponential that we are surfing in terms of like language based uh, diagnostics and AI systems for that over here. But the key thing is that simulation thing because real world data is not there. Yeah, I, I had a question. I had a couple of questions for you actually about the, the self play loop. And, and one of them, maybe this is just a version of, of a question I asked earlier, but. I'm thinking about when you're when you're simulating dialogues about the LLM agents you're using and their their conversational dispositions insofar as you know they might be RLH stuff or, or something like this. And I'm curious about how you think the ways in which those conversational dispositions impact things like 
the patients that your diagnostic agent would be able to handle pretty well. So I'm wondering, you know, maybe maybe somebody just has a really antagonistic tone over a telemedicine chat or something. And if that's kind of a question you're interested in and how you think about these dispositions in, in the context of, of a loop like this. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's a fascinating question. Um, and so we have been doing that analysis quite a bit. Uh, we haven't, uh, we didn't talk about that in the preprint version of the paper, uh, but you're right. I think the doctors, when you're talking with people in the real world, um, there can be people who are like anxious and worried uh, or people who are like really talkative and chatty, but don't give you any information at all. Or people who are just angry uh, or people who may like lack like English communication skills to be able to like accurately represent what their concerns are. Um, and you might even ha- end up like when you deploy the system in a real world, like having someone like really with like adversarial or nefarious intents uh, who are like just trying to break the system and trying to say something silly so that they can like screenshot it and put it on Twitter and make it go viral and call, hey, look, this model's crazy. Um, so being able to, you know, account for all those different kinds of behavior is really, really important. Uh, but that is, again, where simulation comes in, because if you're looking at like human red teaming uh, or human based uh, evaluation to be able to do this it's simply not scalable it won't work at all Um, and so that's what we've been trying to do here where we've been trying to um, design patients uh, or people with not just like different um, diseases and symptom presentations or medication histories and so on and so forth but also like different kinds of personalities or different kinds of intents uh, and then trying to make sure that the doctor agent is like robust to all those kind of different behaviors and sticks to its guardrails um, and guidelines. And um, and those guidelines are again defined by, they can be very context specific depending on where you are deploying these things and systems. And so even that can change quite a bit. But the key thing is to ensure that the, the, the model is doing the right thing, no matter what is being thrown at it. And the right thing is based on what is provided to it at like uh, inference time. And so... Uh, that is where we are expanding the simulation capabilities to make sure that it is happening over here. Another thing you talked about in, in the process of building this was the the chain of reasoning you do for, for online inference. And you have the series of sequential model calls where you're analyzing patient information, formulating response and action, refining the response. One thing that's that's come up in, in conversations I've had with people who have worked on various applications when it comes to chaining LLM calls and things like this is that there is a, a loss of information that comes along. And so one thing I've, I've heard people say that they'd prefer, and there are, there are all these trade-offs when it comes to costs and other things that one might worry about, especially if you're building a product, is maybe if your model is able to appropriately, appropriately attend to all of its contacts just in a single call, then maybe that will have better retention of information than chaining a bunch of sequential model calls. So I was kind of curious if you found that in your application, maybe the answer is a no here, whether chaining calls and the way you did had any impacts on the the information that was retained at each step. Yeah, so I think in our study, uh, maybe that didn't happen quite a bit because uh, we were still ensuring that like the original, the dialogue conversation was part of the context. Uh, while the, the intermediate outputs were presented and the model was asked to uh, work on this and refine it and produce the next stage of output, it still could refer back to the original context if it wanted to. Um, and the instructions that we provided were to make sure that you know there's no loss of information happening um, or like being as faithful as possible to the original context over here. Um, so uh, you know doing that, I think uh, helped us like uh, make sure that the model was you know not like missing out on information. I think the other, the challenge is more less about missing out on inf- information. It was more like making sure the model was not hallucinating anything new, um, because for numerical values, right, things like um, measurements of your blood glucose or things like that that might, might be part of the patient record or of the conversation, it's very easy for a model to uh, hallucinate that. Um, and so, and and subtle change in like one digit or one number would mean completely different things. And so for us, I think the challenge was actually that part uh, to making sure that the model was actually the, the things that it was, the numerical values that it was using was really well grounded in the patient record and the dialogue and like not uh, hallucinating anything new um, rather than say leading to like any kind of loss of information. So so I would say we focus more on that. Um, 
And then again, I feel like uh, in this study, we weren't dealing or working with, say, some of the long cortex models that have still since then come up online. Um, but maybe with like the newer generation of models as we are working through them, I feel like that might be less of a problem. Um, it may still not be perfect because we've seen that there are patterns uh, in terms of like retrieval and needle in the haystack from the context. So if there are things in the middle that may not be attended to properly, uh, but then you can fix that with appropriate um, optimizations, training objectives and post-training um, things that you do. So, so that's the hope over here. So I would say the challenge for us was more like making sure there were no halluc hallucinations on key details. I have um, one other question that's a little bit more on the results you found in this paper. One of the things you did that was really interesting was you tested Amy versus primary care physicians along kind of a, a range of different areas of medical expertise. And I, I want to poke you about uh, whether, whether you have theories about some of these results. So, so one of them that struck me as interesting and I think you noted as well, was that both primary care physicians and Amy performed worse in um, obstetric or, or gynecology and internal medicine scenarios versus other specialties. And I'm curious if you have any theories about what explains that. Oh, yeah. Um, I believe the reason for this and uh, some of my clinician teammates, they came up with this was I think those two specialties require, really require a real in-person visit uh, to be able to say what's wrong. Uh, compared to some of the other things uh, that we were evaluating on. So that was the key thing. Without seeing the person uh, face to face, uh, it's very difficult to make diagnosis and predictions. And so uh, that was a limitation for both uh, the doctors as well as the AI system over here. And so if you see the performance for both went down in that speciality uh, because it really calls for in person cons consultations and uh, uh, onward uh, uh, procedures and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, yeah, and also not sure about internal medicine, but like the other one, urology and Obega, and they're maybe also a little uh, less common. Uh, and uh, so the knowledge might also be lacking a little bit over there as to how to deal with these for both the AI systems as well as the PCPs. And so that's where we have more work to do maybe. I'm wondering then if a similar theory kind of explains why say the model did so well in neurology and respiratory. I thought it was also interesting that primary care physicians did well on neurology, but not so much on respiratory, although I guess that kind of has to do with particular clinical expertise. But I'm wondering if your explanation for that would look pretty similar. Yeah, the neurology one, I'm maybe less certain because to me, at least that feels like a more of a specialized area. The respiratory one for sure is more common um, and uh, both PCPs and AI systems deal with it. Uh, quite a bit. So, yeah, I think that explains respiratory, but neurology, I'm maybe a little less certain. Uh, I have some questions on the other paper that was in this Amy blog post towards accurate differential diagnosis with LLMs. Before I, before I pester you about it, do you want to maybe introduce this paper a little bit? Sure. So, the, the conversational paper was more focused on, uh, you know, can an LLM acquire information under uncertainty to be able to you know, make diagnosis and assist people in their care journeys. Uh, but there's this, so it would, the assumption was the LLM would be facing like a person uh, or a patient. Uh, but there's also the other flip side of the question, right? What if the, the LLM was like kind of like an assistant to a real doctor? Um, and so how would that kind of interaction pan out and play out? Um, and so the goal of the study was to primarily assess that. Um, again, we could have worked with more scenarios that are more reflective of real world workflows like we had with the conversational paper. But then over here, we decided to uh, do like the far end of the spectrum over here, which is like really complex cases uh, and see how LLMs might be able to assist with that. Because uh, one of the theories, again, that we have is at least in the near term where AI systems might be really helpful in clinical workflows is in these kind of scenarios uh, where because you know doctors are not facing or seeing these uh, cases commonly, they might not be able to provide the best possible guidance or care, whereas LLMs, because of their broad knowledge, training, uh, and the ability to retrieve information in different ways might be, might be more beneficial over here. And so that was kind of the hypothesis that we tried to test, and we looked at these very complex cases 
and uh, we source them from the new england journal of medicine which uh, has been running these challenges weekly for i think over 100 years now which is really cool um uh, and so if you look at the case presentations um uh, they're very detailed well curated and they also have other artifacts like the patient's uh, lab tests and records and like imaging data uh, but it's not in the raw form but rather like 2d representations or images of that but still like very useful information in there um and so when we were doing uh, met palm i looked at those set of challenges and i thought uh, maybe in three years uh, llms might be able to do well on them but turns out uh, in six months uh, these models were already starting to do well um, so that speaks about you know the progress and uh, even like people in other areas or in other domains like the progress that we have seen especially in the last year has surprised a lot of us and so this was one of those moments um, but the key thing is was again like it's not just about re retrospective evaluations but like seeing in like simulations of real world environments how these systems would perform um, so we again put together like a chat interface uh, with like the case uh, data with the case study and then we had like uh, experienced uh, but like uh, uh, general doctors like PCPs. I, no, I don't think it was PCPs over there. It was probably internal medicine residents over there. Uh, and we asked them like, uh, like can you solve these cases? Um, and uh, and then we wanted to explore if they had a, a access to like an assistive tool, like an LLM that they can talk to. Uh, like imagine like Sherlock with a Watson. Uh, can they do better with that? Um, so that was kind of the goal of the study. And we had like four arms over there. One was um, uh, clinicians unassisted uh, without any kind of resource. We had another arm, which is clinicians assisted with uh, search and other books and tools that they could use. Um, and we felt this is appropriate because even when I go to my primary care doctor, I see that they like, you know, just open up Google um, and type them and sometimes get their information there. So that, that's a very common workflow. And then we had the arm with the LLM. Uh, like if they had access to this chatbot, uh, would they do better? Um, and of course, we had that LLM only arm. Um, and so we ha we conducted a study, and again, we found that there was this very significant assistive effect with the LLM, and that was much more than compared to using tools like search. Um, but obviously, like a lot of the people uh, picked up on the fact that the LLM alone was doing much better than the clinicians. Um, I wouldn't personally read too much into that because I feel like these are like really, really complex cases that people do, like clinicians don't see in their everyday scenarios. And so that's not reflective of what they do in their everyday uh, workflow. Um, but it is more reflective of where LLMs might in the near term be useful, which is in some of these more complex scenarios. And uh, even in like, you know, certain other anecdotal evidence where we have like uh, any systems with some of our own uh, teammates, we've seen that in some of these rare scenarios where, for example, uh, doctors not are not able to very quickly get to the right diagnosis or if it requires like multiple visits over multiple months it's like just having one interaction with uh, amy and i think there are similar anecdotal evidences with chat gpt as well or gpt4 uh, that you can very quickly get down to the right information that can very quickly help you uh, understand what's wrong with you what's the diagnosis and then move on to the next steps uh, maybe one last thing i would say over here is uh, the reason for this is again like if you think about doctors and especially uh, probably primary care doctors, their priors are more anchored to what is most common. And so they try to think in that space of things. And for specialty doctors, they generally, I wouldn't say clueless, but they are less knowledgeable about some of the other things. And so if you go to like a nephrologist, they would just think that the problem is with your kidney and like try to go deep into seeing what is the problem and then come up with hypothesis, even if that might not be true. Um, but with LLMs, I feel like they are, because they lack those priors or they're not baked in, um, and I alluded to the fact that I think we need to bake them in, but in the right way. Um, uh, but because they are not baked in, I think they're able to come up with, uh, like they're able to integrate information better and come up with like more broad possibilities of what could be wrong. And especially for some of the rare scenarios and cases, that is really helpful. Um, so I, for example, had like a skin problem recently, which uh, I went to my PCP, they come up with something, um, and it didn't really help, but it turns out that they had the right diagnosis. But then I went in again, and then the second doctor got it wrong. Um, and so I was like really, really worried. And then uh, I went back to the doctor again. They couldn't really figure it out. But then I went back to Amy and I asked like, what's wrong? And among the list of things, I think the third thing was what uh, was actually wrong with, uh, what was the problem with me? Um, and so the reason for this is again, like because doctors are like just hyper-focused uh on their speciality or what they or, or what their priors are whereas i think llms are just like much better at like integrating all the information and taking 
like a more unified view of like what could be wrong and coming up with, with like the set of differentials over here. What do you think is the right way to bake relevant priors into LLMs? How do you think about that? Huh. Yeah, I think that's, uh, uh, I don't know if it's even the right thing to be doing at this point of time, to be honest, because uh, if you are really looking at like the complementarity benefits uh, of LLMs with uh, human experts, it might actually be coming in from the fact that these LLMs lack priors to some extent. I mean, I wouldn't say they don't have any priors because obviously because you're training on the internet and the internet is biased. Uh, and so the priors that these have, uh, that these models are actually just coming in from the regular internet. Um, and so, uh, so there is that notion, um, but the fact that it's just so broad that, uh, I think it just gets marginalized a little bit better compared to what say human doctors have and, the uh, the narrowness of the knowledge that they might have, uh, and that's true for humans in general. Um, so yeah, I think this could be done in various different ways, right? I think the, the reinforcement of the data that you have during the specialization phase, that can be more focused on, say, sp- certain specialities of knowledge that you're doing. So that part of like fine-tuning uh, can really help. Uh, you can frame your instruction uh, fine-tuning data in such a way that you ask the model to sp- specifically consider certain areas before uh, thinking about things more broadly or like the way you tr- structure your chain of thought or chain of reasoning can also help with reinforcing that. Again, like uh, in terms of the contextual information that you retrieve uh, at uh, inference time, that can focus on spe- certain specialities that incorporate your prior knowledge and you can put them back in. Uh, and then that can, I mean, so it, it's not like rigorous probabilistic ways of like doing this, but I feel like these are probably more practically uh, viable and useful. Um, even, again, during your post-training, you can do this. Uh, the feedback data that you collect can, again, reinforce for uh, certain priors that you want and make sure that the model is falling away more often than not. So I feel like we don't have to change the tooling around too much, uh, just creative ways in which you're doing your uh, data curation, your instruction fine tuning, your post training and your retrieval augmented generation. I think all of them can just help you with uh, reinforcing these priors. And then again, the scalable oversight mechanisms, the constitutions that uh, I talked about, again, over there, you can reinforce these things. Uh, but that is second tied with your uh, post training, RLEIF, RLHF over here. Maybe that's worth spending a second on actually, because when it comes to the feedback mechanisms and figuring out criteria, what to focus on, things like this. That is something you naturally probably want feedback from from experts, for example, in, in conceptualizing. So in some of your work, you've actually had clinicians craft prompts for these systems. And I'm curious about how you think, I, I want to know kind of how you think about where, where that expertise comes from, because I, I would suppose we, we talked about medical consensus earlier. And so maybe on certain topics, a lot of experts are going to agree on things. But I could imagine that maybe there there are certain things you could delve into where two clinicians, both of whom are highly qualified, highly capable, highly successful, disagree on something. And so I'm curious if you see your work getting to that point where this might become relevant. And then if so, how you think about that. Yeah, I think that happens all the time for uh, us. And this predates generative models, uh, even with like uh, medical imaging classifiers that we were building, um, uh, like trying to get like the diagnosis on say fundus images uh, or radiology images uh, without the outcomes data. Uh, if you ask like uh, three expert radiologists, you would probably end up getting three different uh, opinions over here in terms of the severity and what is the actual pathological finding. Um, so we worked on this for years. I mean, typically the way we try to get around that is uh, just increasing the sample size of the data that you're considering for training, as well as ensuring that the adjudication is done by uh, panels uh, that are not just like one clinician, but rather sometimes that can go into like the tens or, or even more. And if you can refine the ground truth in hierarchical manners, uh, like like, you know, clinicians, for example, you have a radiologist, you look at an image, you come up with your own opinion. And then in your second round, you look at the opinions of everyone else, uh, change your opinion or not. And that can often give you useful data as well uh, in, you know, in in terms of like, you know, modeling uh, for, for, for mounting purposes. And so you've done a lot of work on that over here uh, uh, for the, in the previous era of like supervised uh, medical AI systems that we were building that I think also carries over quite a bit. Um, and so I think getting ground truth and getting adjudication data is probably the hardest. And the most reliable proxy is 
just outcomes data. Sometimes you might, for things like oncology, you might get that with biopsies, but again, they're not perfect. Uh, so if you don't have outcomes data, um, it's very, very difficult. And so that's a challenge that we have to like, like perpetually deal with. And there's no uh, easy way around that. Um, and then I guess with LLMs, uh, it's important for the model to be able to, uh, able to say that uh, it depends on the context a little bit, but like if the model is able to accurately communicate like why things, these two possibilities might be there and not just this one thing, and also uh, accurately convey its degree of uncertainty and being able to like cite its sources and so on and so forth, then I think it will be really, really helpful again. And so that can expand the set of things that doc doctor might consider uh, and like really then complement and augment them. Uh, so the hope is more of that. The hope is not towards getting to uh, getting the model to just say that this is the only thing, but rather like expand the set of things that need to be considered. And then if you have like an expert in the loop, they can account for the the priors as well and everything else that they are seeing that the model might not have seen. Uh, and as well as everything else, the model produces of extra auxiliary information and that hopefully helps them uh, reach a more precise and accurate answer. And thinking about expert in the loop, the the trust component of things that you talked with me about earlier kind of came up in this paper. So one of the things you, you brought up was clinicians were, were pretty excited about using LLMs, but they were also pretty aware of these shortcomings. And you didn't get a chance to explore how much clinicians trusted the outputs of the model or, or their understanding of its training limitations and so on. And so I'm, I'm curious, what, what kinds of, of studies of this sort do you want to do? Yeah, again, great question. I feel like even in this study, we were like barely scratching the surface. And the fact that uh, uh, the performance of the clinician AI compound system was not as good as the AI alone suggests that there are severe shortcomings in the UX interface uh, that did not lead to optimal collaboration. So there's still like headroom over there. Um, and one of the things that we are definitely concerned about is models producing seemingly accurate information that is false, but like the doctor is just picking, uh, picking them. And so teaching the doctors or the experts in the loop, depending on the application, uh, what to watch out for and when these models can go wrong and in what situations and not to like blindly trust them is, I think, going to be really, really critical uh, as these systems become more broadly useful and helpful because there is the tendency uh, is uh, to just blindly trust the models output and use them. Um, and uh, that might work most of the time, but can also lead to like some... Uh, terrible things and so it's really important that you know doctors or like whoever is using these systems are really, really vigilant over here um, and again that comes down to what the model communicates and how it communicates and so the more accurate the model has uh, of its own inherent uncertainty uh, in the answer and the more accurately and precisely it's able to communicate and this might not just be through language this might be via multimodal information by other things that it retrieves uh, and also how the the information is presented and so that's not just like a or you just get all these information presented and dump it into the clinician no that's going to cause a lot of cognitive overload over here so being able to like you know design the right ux interfaces to be able to like put that information and like being able to like efficiently refer to that and account for that is also going to be really, really critical so i feel like a lot of in innovation that's going to happen in the next um year or two is actually going to be in that realm like how to re define and uh create the most optimal user interface for these collaborations between AI systems and expert humans. Uh, and that might be very, very domain specific, workflow specific, uh, but that's fine. That's what's needed. I want to talk about UI in a second, but maybe jumping back to the point about blind trust, it, it seemed to me like from what you said, and, and maybe just from doctors in general, they're pretty smart people. And so I, I do feel like a lot of them are probably if they were going to use these systems, they'd at least be well aware enough not to trust them blindly and kind of be aware of limitations. And I think this is what you said in the paper again about them being aware of this. But it was really interesting to me that one of the components of trust was not just of the model's outputs themselves, but of their own understanding of the model's training and limitations. And I'm curious how you think about that component of things when it comes to maybe you can structure some sorts of training for clinicians so that they get to a point where maybe you are satisfied. But how do you think about also enabling that kind of self-trust that you're talking about? 
Yeah, again, it's a great question. So uh, even when we have uh, clinicians interacting with, say, such UX interfaces, what we do is we have like a pilot phase uh, where we onboard them onto these tools and we run some studies where we measure these kind of things. And so you can intentionally inject data uh, that seems like very convincing, but is actually misleading or just wrong. And then you can measure things like how often they're like blindly trusting the outputs uh, or the, the opposite might also be true. Like clinicians have such strong priors or they might be so opinionated that they will never take a model's output. They will always say, oh, no, my thing is correct. Uh, and so uh, I think that that pilot onboarding phase is again, like really, really important for, and that's true for any kind of software in general, but like certainly for such systems uh, and being able to measure and get qualitative information through like expert interviews and so on and so forth is important. So for example, uh, if you have, uh, if you design like uh, a system and then if you say these are the limitations, like doing very simple things like quizzes of like um, the, the experts understanding of like the limitations and implementing them in like practical scenarios and seeing if they like really understood those and where maybe say some of the language or the wording was not accurate and appropriate um, can help. And then again, things like measuring like what was the diagnosis before getting the LLM's interaction or the outputs and what was the diagnosis after and then getting like qualitative reasons for changing or not changing the diagnosis. Again, those nuggets of information that you can get uh, can often like make like very consequential, uh, can give you very consequential information that you can incorporate in terms of like further refining and improving these systems. And so... uh, these are not easy to do, These, uh, especially with experts who are like, it's not easy to get hold of them and they're like very expensive. Uh, but these are like, I think the things that will really make a lot of difference when you're like deploying them in real settings. And so uh, we can't really ignore that. And I think the current interface that you have, and I know that a lot of um, doctors in different parts of the world are just dumping information into like, say the GPT-4 uh, UI. That's not at all optimal, I think, um, especially if you're not an expert it's very, very easy to get convinced by the model on uh, and just blindly trust it. And so it really requires like a very discerning eye and an expert to be able to say when it is wrong. Um, and uh, even though we think doctors are well trained, uh, their knowledge is still very, knowledge- very, very narrow. And biology and medicine is very, very broad. It's, uh, and so, um, again, that is, I think, going to be exceptionally important going ahead. Do you have any pictures in mind about what UI needs to look like, I think, to kind of walk this line between you want it to be maybe more helpful than just interacting with something like a simple text box. And this is true maybe both for patients who might interact with a conversational telemedicine system, but then also doctors who are working with this sort of thing. Um, But then also balancing that line between you can offer more information, maybe if you have a multimodal system or something like this, then there are different ways in which you can communicate. But you also want to be careful not to again, as you're talking about um, over index or show people things that would cause them to trust it more than is warranted. I think this is something that kind of comes up a lot in explainable AI. So I'm curious if you have, you know, particular visions of, of what UI could look like to navigate that. I don't know if there's one right answer over here. I think that will take like a lot of experimentation and iterations in the real world. And uh, I'm certainly not a Uh, UX expert over here, but what we are doing is just trying a bunch of different mechanisms over here. Um, And so the the chat interface itself is not going to go away, but I feel like the key thing is to be able to augment that chat information with like other kinds of multimodal data, whether that's, you know, similar, say, patients or resources or videos from the web or like information from the guideline. Uh, And then just like presenting that information in a compact and easily digestible manner. Uh, and like with say, the right highlights and the right reasons for why you think that is relevant, I think that's going to be the key. And so it could be that you place it in one corner and it's completely ignored. You place it in another corner and then people overly index on top of it. And a lot of these things, again, come down to the individual workflows. Uh, so like the way you design that interface for like a cardiologist would vary a lot compared to that for a radiologist and so on and so forth. So it's very, very, again, like speciality and domain specific. Um but uh, at this point of time, I don't know if there's a right answer, but rather like it's like a continuous cycle of like moving fast and iterating on these things with the experts themselves and making sure that they are comfortable with what they're seeing. And then you're measuring appropriately. You need to measure everything properly. And so you put these cases and measure all these different effects and seeing that you're like, you know, going towards where you really care about. Right. We know we're not quite there yet. One thing you you mentioned in this paper is that the models you were working with tended to 
draw conclusions from from isolated systems and you want to move towards getting them to or, or it would be desirable to get them to move towards viewing complex cases a little bit more holistically and that could make them more helpful as a tool perhaps i'm curious if you have thoughts on why this tended to happen and kind of what what work you need to do yeah so that part i don't know for sure and might just come down to the base properties of the model as well uh, in terms of like if you feed information a lot of information into the context of the model what does it pay attention to and where does it pay attention to and there are various studies that have been done um, on base foundation models and LLMs over here which suggest that certain things at certain places may not uh, receive enough attention and so that might force the model uh, to ignore them um, and so uh, I think at least for that part, we might actually just be carrying over properties of the base foundation model that we are building on over here and running into some of the limitations that can uh, actually be quite harmful in the setting. Um, and so the key is uh, to be able to identify that first and then fix those problems with other technical and algorithmic solutions to be to make sure that that is not happening. And, I, and uh, at least in medical settings, because um, latency is not a huge constraint over here, it's more important to be right than to be fast. Um, the uh, uh, like the and with even with our chain of reasoning approach, for example, what we've been doing is in uh, investing in these compound AI systems. And I know like Stanford likes to give names to things, uh, even though they don't actually come up with these things. And that was the same with foundation models as well. Uh, but it's a good name. Um, so we have the same thing over here. And so so one of the ways in which you can get over those things is by making sure that you do repeated inference calls and uh, design like good measures of soft uncertainty that can then help the LLM uh, seek out what information it needs to reduce its uncertainty and then go back and refine its answers. And so these approaches of like compound AI systems with built-in uncertainty mechanisms and self-refinement and self-improvement uh, can, I think, really help like, you know, get over this. But I don't know to what extent this is a problem and it might be that there is some irreducible uh, errors that actually just need innovations in the base model uh, and in how attention is performed, especially in non-context scenarios to be able to account for that. So um, we haven't hit that wall yet. Uh, so we're still in, uh, working in this realm of like compound AI systems and we feel there's still a lot to be done, but it might be that, be that there are some irreducible errors that we can't get over. Yeah, yeah. I, I was kind of wondering about how advances and you know context windows and then different sorts of prompt techniques could impact this because I, I i do think that there's maybe an argument that with the right prompting of hey pay attention to this part of the prompt for instance you can you can eke out more performance but it feels like that isn't going to be super scalable if you have to craft that kind of prompt for every input you want to give the model for instance yeah um i think that's certainly true and uh, we're starting to also see that um uh... With approaches like prompt breeders and with uh, uh, some of these approaches which are as these compound AI systems become more and more complex with like a graph or a network of LLM inference calls or maybe even to like multiple different LLM systems. Uh, you can get certainly get a, a long way by using humans to craft them. But uh, again, we are running into this place where we are seeing uh, with more algorithmic approaches. So like if you use like directed graph evolution with like fitness functions and optimize for that, they can actually lead you to a more optimal set of like inference calls that can optimize, jointly optimize for a bunch of different parameters that you care about. And that includes not only things like, you know, accuracy or the end task performance, but also maybe your latency. Um, and uh, especially maybe you have like a combination of LLM systems. Some of them are like specialized and narrow, but like you know, less expensive. And then you have like one giant LLM, which might be more expensive. And so how do you stage that? And when do you back off to the giant LLM? And at what time do you perform that? Uh, so today that is uh, still a large part of that, uh, especially I would say outside of say some of the key industry labs are uh, happening with humans and for good reason. I think that's good. There's a lot to be squeezed out over there. But again, I feel like algorithm, uh, algorithmic approaches will actually replace that. And so things like prompt breeder are still like, like you know, just scratching the surface. Uh, we have some work uh, at Google DeepMind that looks at more like graph evolution approaches. And I think that are really promising. And so, yeah, it feels like everywhere there are like human heuristics, uh, human knowledge-based heuristics, that's all going to be replaced with ML or learned systems. And this is no different. I've got one last question for you before I let you go. And this is maybe coming back to some of the broad questions we were talking about at the start of this conversation, more about the, the sorts of impacts you think about when it comes to your work. 
And so if you had to maybe paint a picture of what these systems look like, how they are able to work within the world, within medical situations, and what that would have to look like for you to say, personally, my work here is done, like Vivek is out, you know, I've done what I needed to do in this space. What, what do you think that looks like? I think at the short term, uh, maybe like a two year horizon, uh, I would love to see a lot of evidence of these systems being really helpful to our care providers and care systems. And then going through the appropriate regulatory processes, if, especially if they are used in like you know, very safety critical uh, settings and scenarios, as clinical decision support is a good example, uh, and actually being really used in hospitals everywhere, uh, not just true in America, but uh, across the world. Um, the key thing is, again, not like replacing doctors, uh, but rather like really amplifying them and augmenting their knowledge and experience and expertise. Um, and so if we can get to that state in a, a few years where the standard of care is no longer just a doctor acting on their own, but like a doctor really aided and augmented by these LLM systems, uh, then that would be great. Uh, and then maybe stretching forward a little bit more uh, along like, say, more of the five to 10 year horizon, um, I, I would want to see these systems being really like people facing and patient facing. And so hopefully the first interaction with uh the healthcare system can be with an AI, um, and uh, and hopefully the AI is so smart that uh, it does not have to be episodic anymore. Rather, it's like a continuous interaction that happens over months and years. And it's like truly your personal AI that is uh, like allowing you to optimize your health and well-being to be like the best possible version of yourself. Um, and for a large fraction of like uh, the concerns that you have, the medical concerns that you have. The model is able to handle it uh, for you and do the right things for you and assist you. Um, and then, in cases where it needs human expertise, uh, it is able to like uh, effectively back off and invoke the human in the loop. And uh, so, if we are able to achieve that and like really democratize that expertise and experience um, to everyone, like really put like. Uh, I don't want to again call this an AI doctor, but whatever thing, like, but put it really in the pocket of everyone everywhere. And they're able to like instantly invoke it. And so like there's no waiting time for access to medical expertise. Rather, you have it instantaneously. And it's no longer episodic. Uh, there's like a lot of like uh, second degree, third degree things that would happen in such a world. And I uh, maybe not that intelligent enough to like predict what would happen. But just imagine where like the, the interaction with healthcare and with like your health coach and your fitness coach is just no longer episodic. It is continuous over long time horizons. And I'm really excited to be able to like see that future and what happens. Like how are people going to be able to leverage and use that and improve that? And again, this world or this vision of the world is not going to happen in like a uniform manner. Um, and so the key thing is to be able to ensure that uh, as these systems become more viable, uh, they are everyone's able to like leverage the benefits of them and it's not restricted to like like only the top few or like uh, people in certain geographies and so on and so forth um so i feel like that is again over a 10 year horizon if you do things the right way uh you know bring everyone along with us in this journey that is possible um and uh, that would be an immensely exciting future to live in and uh, the parallel to this and again i keep coming back to this is uh what we are trying to build is not just an AI doctor, but like in the process of doing this and really like encoding the biomedical universe. And if you think about like increasingly how much uh, biological data that we are de generating at like lower levels of resolution, um, that is actually uh, tracking Moore's law as well. And so the more and more data that we are able to bring into these AI systems, um, they they're going to like really develop like really holistic representations of the biological universe and the human body in general. And uh, so once that happens, like what sort of new knowledge that you uncover, how can you use that knowledge to effectively eradicate diseases that are like really like putting a lot of burden on health systems worldwide, uh, design like better therapies or drugs for people that are individualized and personalized. And uh, so again, that doesn't seem far away like an AI physician scientist. Um, and uh, this model again mimics like humans. So if you look at some of the greatest uh, physician scientists of our times like Alexander Fleming and Jonas Salk, they used to be like practicing uh, clinicians. So they would see patients in their morning and then 
use all that data or the inferences or clues that they would find to go back into the labs at night and design drugs and therapies. And that's how like the benefit, uh, the breakthroughs around penicillin and others came out. And so with these hybrid physician uh, scientist systems like AI systems, how can we accelerate that and like really un- like push the frontiers of biomedical knowledge? Um, and uh, so that's really interesting. And and to me, like uh, a future where there are no human diseases, uh, again, that seems plausible over a few decade horizon. And so I can't predict what would happen in that future, like the second order, third, degree, third order efforts, third degree efforts over here that um, uh, I'm not so sure about. But again, it would be nice to live in that world. Well, I'm, I'm really excited about the possibility of that world and uh, also very excited about the work you and your team have been doing and are continuing to do to bring us closer there. Thank you for doing this. Uh, thanks so much, Daniel. It was a true pleasure talking to you. It was, uh, yeah, it was a great conversation. Thank you for listening. Thank you to my guest, Vivek Nadarajan. If you like this, it would help me out a lot if you'd consider spreading the word, and I'll see you in the next episode.